Uh, Bill mentioned, uh, you know, we've all done a lot of rotten sins. I've been with Bill when he's done a lot of those rotten <laughs> sins. <laughs> That's part of the reason I chose that hymn for us to sing today. <laughs> you know, the definition of an optimist is a person who plays a trumpet and carries a pager. Uh, it'll take a moment for you to... Just a joke, Bill. It's just a joke. Have a little fun. With I remember one cold uh, winter morning back when Dr. Walford was president and we had, uh, we had a few Saturday morning classes and one of my Saturday morning classes was taught by... Um, uh, S. Lewis Johnson, Dr. S. Lewis Johnson, not gone, and and uh, taught a lot of us on the platform uh, Greek, and and uh, for some of us it was more of a challenge for him than for others. And uh, I happened to be walking along as he was making his way uh, to the class. He hated cold weather, had a big heavy black coat on, a hat on, and and he's from the Carolinas, and so this kind of cold weather for him was unusual. And he said, uh, I said, good morning, Dr. Johnson. He said, uh, mm. I said, um, how are you? Uh, uh, not well. You know the problem with this school, Chuck? I said, uh, no, sir. Run by a bunch of Yankees. <laughs> bunch of Yankees have class on days this cold. I'm so excited about this new year, I can hardly stand it. I, I have to tell you. It's always amazing to me that people are bored. There are folks that are actually bored in life. Like a fellow named Lawrence Walters from San Pedro, California. Uh, let me tell you about Lawrence. He said one day, enough is enough. What I need is a little adventure. Tired of just sitting around. So on the 2nd of July that year, he rigged up 42 helium-filled weather balloons, tied them to a Sears lawn chair, and lifted off. <laughs> True story. Armed with only a pellet gun <laughs> to help handle the elevation issues. Before he knew it, he was shocked to realize he was 16,000 feet high. Walters sort of had his breath taken away about that level. Mine started getting a little fuzzy. He wasn't the only one surprised. Pilot in a Southwest airline <laughs> radioed the tower and said, some guy is in a lawn chair <laughs> floating across the sky. <laughs> Thankfully, Walters had enough presence of mind to start shooting out the balloons, which allowed him to land uh, about 45 minutes later in Long Beach. But that bizarre experience got him on a Tonight Show and a Timex watch and a Timex ad, and ultimately the guy had to quit his job as he went on the road to deliver motivational speeches. <laughs> That is how hard up we are for motivational speakers. So why in the world did you do that? Was the common question everybody asked him. He says, uh, people ask me that a lot. They want to know if I had a, like a death wish or something. And he said, I, I just told him, no, I just had to do something. I couldn't just keep sitting there. The guy's a nut. <laughs> You imagine people just sitting there. You can't and I can't. What a terrible way to spend a year just sitting around, just wondering and waiting for something to happen with years unfolding like these years, the best years of our lives and the best is yet to come. We just sang about it. Now, how exciting is it that we can we can walk into 12 new months. Well, the half of it's already gone. So 11 and a half of the months now that are unrolling in front of us, which I want to talk to you about. And um, I want to warn you too, before we get into these months very far, that, that there are dangers lurking. 
A uh, couple of three of them that came to my mind as I put my thoughts together. There's a danger of our walking in the flesh instead of the spirit. And uh, uh, suffering the consequences. Not walking by faith, but walking by sight. Which fills our lives with worry. Stupid worries. Then there's a danger of uh, planning every detail right down to the gnat's whisker. And forgetting the most important part of all, and that's praying for direction as we walk into these 11 and a half months that remain. And the, the danger of running ahead of God rather than waiting for him to open doors and to make the path straight and to clear the obstacles instead of our trying to move them out of the way ourselves. And that constant battle everybody has with worry. Uh, chances are good your worry list is longer than your prayer list. You're all worried about some big thing on the horizon. And, and it's a very real uh, probability it'll never happen. My worst worries and fears never realized throughout my life. And, of course, the greatest of all the worries is the worry regarding uh, when our last day will come. And that's a serious issue. Of course it is. Peter Marshall, while he was chaplain of the Senate during the days of the Second World War, um, loved to tell the story. It was an old legend of a merchant in Baghdad who one day sent his servant to the market. And before very long, the servant came back white and trembling, and he said to his master, Down at the marketplace, I was jostled by a woman in the crowd. And when she turned and looked at me, I looked right in the face of death. Death jostled me. She made a threatening gesture. And he said, Master, please lend me your horse. I must, I must hasten to avoid her. And I will ride to Samara. And there, uh, death will not find me. Of course, the master lent him his horse. And he galloped away. And that afternoon, the same master made his way into the market. Ran into the same old woman. Walked up to her and said, Why did you frighten my servant this morning? Uh, why did you make that threatening gesture? Her response was, that, that was not a threatening gesture. Death said, it, it was only a start of surprise. I was astonished to see him here in Baghdad. You see, I have a, an appointment with him tonight in Samara. <laughs> we serve a God who has put our lives together start to finish. He's not finding things out along the way. Uh, you'll never hear a gasp coming from heaven. <gasps> wow. I didn't know that. It's planned for us. Our times are in his hands. And some of you are learning that better than others. I have a few timely reminders for you in taking on the new year. They're all based on three simple statements found in James chapter 4. If you brought a testament with you, turn to it as Dr. Trunsaint turns to his Greek text to check it out. Good for him. He's in our church. I look at him every Sunday and I just... Thank God for things like patience on his part and a willingness to listen to me, who was once his student. Talk about an amazing turn of events. Remarkable, he even shows up. So here we are looking at the next few months and we read in verse 13 of James 4. Come on now, you who say, 
Today or tomorrow, we'll go to such and such a city and we'll spend a year there and, and engage in business and make a profit. Yet, look closely, students, faculty members, friends of the seminary. You do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live. And then we will do this or that. Love this passage of scripture. Love it. Preach on it every new year. Whoever's from Stonebriar Church, you heard me bring this talk a few Sundays ago. It's a great reminder, not just at the beginning of a new year, but how easy it is to play God, especially when we get a little theology under our belt. <laughs> it's easy to think uh, we got him figured out. I remember when Donald Gray Barnhouse up in Pennsylvania, up, up in Philadelphia used to stand before a simple microphone, a Bible in his hand, and he'd take, he'd take questions from the audience, called it Open Forum. And his, his student up in the balcony stood up and said, Dr. Barnhouse, I've been wondering, how could the children of Israel be 40 years in the wilderness and the shoes never wear out and the clothes never wear out and they never went hungry? Dr. Barnhouse's answer was, God! He kind of had the voice of the fourth member of the Trinity, you know. <laughs> God! The kid goes, oh, now I understand. <laughs> Barnhouse said, no, you don't, son. Nobody understands. Isn't that great? Nobody understands. We've got an old year that's passed. We've got a new year coming. And if we're not careful... We'll follow our own rules. Look at verse 13. Here are our rules, our rules. First, we choose our time, today or tomorrow. See, we're making plans. We got our day timer or whatever form you use to help organize your life. So we choose our own time, today or tomorrow. Second, we select our location. We go to such and such a city. January, I'm going to be in Dallas. Come July, I'm going to be in Phoenix. Uh, come September, hope to be, and you name that. We, we, we choose the location. We select the, the place we're going to be. Third, we limit our stay. See what it says? We'll spend a year there. So this guy's really got his life organized. And then we arrange our activities. We will engage in business. We even predict a profit. We will make a profit. It's all in verse 13. That's exactly what we do in unguarded moments. I do it when I'm not thinking more wisely. I set out a plan. I got the year in front of me. I love getting my book and going through January and February and March. I get all this thing. I've done all, all the way through December as if I'm going to live to see December. I don't know. I will. Got it all planned out. Now, understand, James is not criticizing good planning. It, he's, he's not advocating being haphazard about uh, our lives, being disorganized. <laughs> Book of Proverbs, which I'm reading with our, one of our grandsons. Every day we're going through a, a, a chapter in the Proverbs. We're going to do it all year long. <laughs> Here I go again. Maybe we're going to go through it all year long. <laughs> if, if I'm still around, if, if he's still around, what a thought. But or, Proverbs is talking about organizing your life. He, what he's addressing is demonstrating mistaken confidence. Stop that. Stop that kind of uh, uh, presumptive living, presumptuous living. In fact, look at the very next verse. You do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. Isn't that a remarkable thought? 
We, we planned out tomorrow, but we don't know what our life will be like tomorrow. I put together a few tomorrows. It's a Thursday. The date is April the 13th. The Secretary of War is Edwin Stanton. He's making plans in the White House for a celebration. Flowers have been ordered. Banners have been raised. The name, Ulysses S. Grant, Victor. It's going to be spread all over. The war, this terrible war between the states. Finally, the bloodshed is ending. They're going to celebrate. And then in the words of Jay Winnick, then came the bullet that bore into his brain, 1865, April 14th, Good Friday, the president's assassinated. The day before, they didn't know a thing about that. Oh, they got the security all buttoned down. President's okay, safe. Thank God the newspapers are finally getting beyond the ugly criticism of this buffoon of an ape-like president, they called him. Now he's dead. Travel with me ahead uh, over 75 years later. It's a Saturday afternoon and a naval officer and his wife are, of all things, finishing the decorating of their little apartment as they're enjoying... Uh, that wonderful tour of duty at Pearl Harbor. December 6th, we'll sleep in tomorrow morning. Got our apartment ready. This is going to be great. Wonderful night of romance together. And boom, the place comes apart the next day, tomorrow, December 7th. 1941, Sunday morning, when all hell broke loose. They never thought of that the day before. He didn't know what their life would be like tomorrow. You and I were not alive in that first tomorrow. Many of you weren't alive in the second I mentioned. Let me mention one where we all were. Monday night football. What a great game it was. <laughs> had a terrific time. The guys on the TV talked too much, so I had it on mute. <laughs> Just enjoyed the game, Cynthia and I and two or three friends we had over in our little, our little home here in Dallas. September 10, 2001. And I'm eating a bowl of cereal on... Tuesday morning in the kitchen, standing up, which is my style when I have breakfast. Not that I'm driven, but. <laughs> and I click on the TV, it's still on mute. And I'm looking at what looks like a Bruce Willis movie. And I'm thinking, how in the world did they film that? I got a son at the School of the Recording Arts down in Florida where they do these uh, animations. And, and I'm thinking, well, he would know how they did that film. And all of a sudden, boom, a plane goes through the second tower. And I scream for Cynthia. And we call our kids. We couldn't get through to one of them. And so I for Living was at that time in a place called EDS, in temporary quarters as our building was being built. And boy, that place shut down. It looked like we were at war. We were tomorrow. <sighs> Isn't that amazing? I mentioned a Thursday in a week. I, I, I mentioned a, a, a Saturday afternoon and in an otherwise delightful week. I mentioned a, 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 a Monday where, by the way, I read later, 12 investors had met on the 101st floor saying, Tomorrow morning we meet and carry out this plan. Come early. And they did. And they never got out of the South Tower. 
You do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. Nor do I. Suddenly it, 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 it makes sense, doesn't it? Oh, James writing way ahead of his time. Why? You're just a vapor. You're just a vapor. Shakespeare writes in Hamlet, uh, Macbeth, he writes, If you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me. No wonder there's such a run on astrologists. Stupid game plan in life. Guide your life by the stars. They don't know either. But we long to know people who know tomorrow. I got a friend who lives in Santa Barbara Canyon. He said, Chuck, when the fire hit, it came like, like a 50 mile an hour flood of flames. He says, I looked up and I saw the smoke and I started making a list. I called my dog over and I got my dog next to me and I'm putting my list together. And I got out of there with a car, a dog and my list. Lost everything else. You don't know what your life's going to be like tomorrow. So, what do we do? Uh, let me give you some things to write down. I've said one of them over and over again, so you hopefully have put that down. You have no knowledge of what tomorrow holds. We have a church out in Frisco filled with people who didn't know what their year held. Before the year started, they didn't know that by the end of the year, they'd be unemployed. Whole bunch of white collar workers unemployed now. Not just white collar workers. One lady didn't know she'd face serious surgery. When they cut her open, they just sewed her back up. It's inoperable. Healthy looking, attractive, a young grandmother. One family didn't know they'd lose the man of the house. 50-year-old pilot with Delta. Layover in Amsterdam. He and his co-pilot friend, flown together for years, went to school together. Decided on their layover, because you have to lay over to get your sleep back so you feel okay to fly back across the pond. And while they're in Amsterdam, this pilot friend of mine and, and the co-pilot says, he says to, they say to each other, let's go bike riding. Boom, hit by a bullet train, gone. Could hardly find their remains. The family didn't know they'd be without a man of the house. This isn't dramatic stuff that we made a movie out of. This is real stuff. I can give you names to every one of these people. It goes on. There was a family that discovered their 15-year-old son is now on drugs. At the top of his class. Got a drug problem he's kept secret for two years. He also been messing around with pornography. All that's come to light. The other, the other side is we have a couple that thought they'd be single forever and they've fallen in love with each other and they can hardly wait to get married in April. They didn't even know each other at the beginning of last year. How exciting is that? I got a pastor friend who was at Schofield Memorial Church, and he's now in Fargo, North Dakota. Ah! <laughs> and I'm driving along in my truck yesterday, and I hear in Fargo, it's 37 below zero. I prayed for Matthew St. John. We have friends from that church, or his friends that are from that church that were visiting our church a few Sundays ago, and they took my hand like they were about to pass out, and they said, pray for our new pastor. He has no idea what winter is like. <laughs> I mean, we shut down schools when it gets to 20 in Dallas. 37 below zero. I could go on. You do not know. How about finances? How about finances? 
I would like to announce today that we're going to take that 200,000 surplus and give it to all the students. I would like to announce that. We're not going to do that, but I would like to announce that today. Yancey wrote this on the last page of the January 09 issue. Listen to this. As analysts began picking through the ruins of the financial collapse, they started dusting off old-fashioned words like greed, moderation, integrity, and trust. When executives line their pockets at the expense of employees and shareholders, when banks make speculative loans with little likelihood of payback, when borrowers walk away with good faith contract from good faith contracts and the system breaks, the system collapses. A functioning economy is held together by a thin web of trust. If you doubt that, visit a country where you have to pay bribes to get action, and you must count your change after every purchase. Then this. The same week that global wealth shrank by $7 trillion, Zimbabwe's inflation rate hit a record 231 million percent. In other words, if you had saved $1 million Zimbabwean dollars on Monday, by Tuesday it's worth $1.58. You have no knowledge of what tomorrow will bring. Second, you have no assurance of a long life. I preached this many times before I ever let the text say what it's saying. And I found that pauses are worth more than words. You are just a vapor, appears for a little while, then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live. Pause. And if the Lord wills, we shall do this or that. You have no assurance of a long life. You see the word he uses to describe our lives? Vapor. Atmis. A-T-M-I-S in the Greek. We get our word atmosphere from it. Puff of smoke is the way one renders it. Another, a wisp of fog. All these hot shots running around three-piece suits looking like big deals. Driven around in limousines, think they got life with the tail. Their life is like a wisp of fog. I bury them earlier, younger now than ever in my ministry. I should have kept a record of the 40 and 50 year olds I've buried in the last two years. It's remarkable. So... We have no assurance of a long life. So here's what we ought to say. If the Lord wills, not about my will, it's about his will. Not about the attorney who draws up a will for my life. It's about the Lord's will. If the Lord wills, we will live, meaning I don't have forever. And then we will do this or that. Three very practical, very practical lessons, and I'm through. Number one, there is a will we need to respect. Our Lord's will. Notice the name, Lord. I don't need to remind you of all that that includes. Our Master. There is a will we need to respect. This, by the way, will guard us from um, pride. Constant problem we all fight, pride. If the Lord wills. Second, there is a destiny we need to remember. This will guard you from presumption. I say work hard. I say give it your best. These are the only few years you'll be at this place. Give it everything you've got. Grades will take care of themselves. Give it everything you've got. Because there's a destiny you need to remember. We're all going to wind up there. And it doesn't mean you run scared, okay? 
was in the grocery store the other day. A very old lady was shopping next to me. And I listened to her. She kind of talking to herself. Or she had one of those ear deals and was talking to somebody. I've answered people in grocery stores. I reached over to get tomatoes one time and she said, no, I've got... And she wasn't talking to me. She's talking to Frank somewhere on the phone. Anyway, this old lady talking to herself, picking among the bananas. No green ones. Don't want to get any green ones. She won't even buy green bananas. Don't, don't live like that. You know, you're going you're gonna to probably make it to tomorrow. You... So there's a destiny we just, we just need to be remembering. But here's the third and the last. There's a life we need to realize. And this will guard you from procrastination. For goodness sake, live. I love Jim Elliott's line, wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. Live it. Don't put it off. Live it. It's a wonderful way to conduct your life. And so much more to do than helium balloons on a lawn chair. Because I'm going to tell you, if you don't, you'll regret it. My brother-in-law opened the bottom drawer of my sister's bureau and lifted out a tissue-wrapped package. This, he said to me, this is not a slip. This is lingerie. He discarded the tissue and handed me the slip. It was exquisite silk, handmade, trimmed with a cobweb of lace. The price tag with an astronomical figure still on it, still attached. Jan uh, bought this the first time we went to New York at least eight or nine years ago, but she never wore it. She was saving it for a special occasion. Well, I guess this is the occasion. He took the lovely slip from me and put it on the bed with the other clothes we were taking to the mortician. His hands lingered on the soft material for a moment, then he slammed the drawer shut. Stood there and then said, don't ever save anything for a special occasion. Every day you're alive is a special occasion. I remembered those words through the funeral and the days that followed when I helped him and my niece attend to all the sad chores that followed an unexpected death. I thought about them on the plane ride returning home from the Midwestern town where my sister's family still lives. I thought about all the things she hadn't seen or heard or done. Thought about the things that that she had done without realizing they were all special. I'm still thinking about his words to me and they've changed my life. I'm not, uh, I'm not saving anything now. We use our good china and crystal for every special event such as losing a pound. <laughs> Getting a sink unstopped. the first camellia blossom in spring. Someday, and one of these days, are losing their grip on my vocabulary. If it's worth seeing or hearing or doing, I want to see and hear and do it now. Now! I'm trying very hard not to put off, hold back, or save anything that would add laughter and luster to my and our lives. And every morning when I open my eyes, I tell myself, this is a special day. A 
Father, thank you for perspective that only you give at times like this. You have an amazing way of never decreasing our joy, but reminding us of the brevity of life and the necessity of living it. Thank you for the warnings against pride and presumption, against procrastination. Help me to live this better than I could ever preach it. Thank you for the year. By your grace, we'll live it. And if it's in your will, we'll see the end of it. Thank you that it's well with our souls because of Christ. In his name we pray. It's like then unassuming greatness. Uh, this is especially true when the one modeling that trait is extraordinarily gifted and magnificently competent and eminently successful, but at the same time remarkably unassuming and unpretentious. It was back in 1971 that the Lord called me and uh, our family out to Southern California to begin a ministry serving him at a local church in that vast megalopolis I didn't realize at the time, but our arrival occurred right when one of those unassuming great men had reached the zenith of his career, and he was in the middle of his most successful time as the head basketball coach at UCLA. His name became, in a matter of a few years, a household word in homes where sport is loved, especially the game of basketball. And all of us out there watched with just uh, eye-opening wonder at the championships he won, but even more significantly at the character of the man himself. His life was filled with a mixture of contrasts. Uh, enormous adulation on the one hand, at the same time, ego-centered athletes who would come on the scene and be under his tutelage as he would add to their life that John wouldn't touch. Uh, Pauli Pavilion was filled uh, home game after home game as these teams came through. And in a matter of years, a whole new squad and yet again another championship. It was a pleasure not only to watch him from the distance, but to get to know him up close and personal and realize that none of this turned his head. He was the same man as he had always been and as he is to this day. I suppose that's the reason that I appreciated years later the words written by Rick Riley of Sports Illustrated, who did a piece on him he titled, A Paragon Rising Above the Madness. Among other things, Riley writes, there's never been a finer man in American college sport than John Wooden or a finer coach. He won 10 NCAA basketball championships at UCLA in 12 years, the last in 1975. Nobody has ever come within six of him. He won 88 straight games between January 30, 71 and January 17, 74. Nobody has come within 42 since then. So sometimes when the madness of March gets to be too much, too many players trying to make sports center, too few players trying to make assists, 
Too many coaches trying to be homies. Too few coaches willing to be mentors. Too many freshmen with out-of-wedlock kids. Too few athletes who will stay in school long enough to become men. I like to go see Coach Wooden. I visit him in his little condo in Encino, 20 minutes northwest of L.A., and hear him say things like, gracious sakes alive, and tell stories about teaching Lewis the hook shot. Lewis, of course, is Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. There's never been another coach like Wooden. Quiet as an April snow, square as a game of checkers, Loyal to one woman all his married life, one school, one way. Walking around campus in his sensible shoes and Jimmy Stewart morals. He'd spend a half hour the first day with those athletes practicing how they are to put on their socks. Wrinkles can lead to blisters, he would warn. These huge players would sneak looks at one another and roll their eyes. Eventually, they'd do it right. Good, he'd say. And now, for the other foot. (laughs) Of the 180 players who played for Wooden, he knows the whereabouts of 172 today. Of course, that's not hard when most of them call checking on his help, secretly hoping to hear some of his simple life lessons so they can write them on the lunch bags of their kids who will roll their eyes. Discipline yourself and others won't have to, Coach would say. Never lie, never cheat, never steal, Coach would say. Earn the right to be confident, Coach would say. You play for him, you play by his rules. Never score without acknowledging a teammate. One word of profanity, you're done for the day. Treat your opponent with respect. He believed in hopelessly out-of-date stuff that never did anything but win 10 championships. (laughs) No dribbling behind the back or through the legs. Uh, There's no need, he'd say. No UCLA basketball number was retired under his watch. Well, what about the other fellows who wore that number? Didn't they contribute to the team then? He'd say, no long hair, no facial hair. It takes too long to dry. You could catch cold. (laughs) Especially when you leave the gym, coach would say. That one drove his players bonkers. One day, All-American center Bill Walton showed up with a full beard. It's my right, he insisted. Wouldn't ask if he believed that strongly. Walton said, yes, I do. Well, that's good, Bill. Coach responded, I admire people who have strong beliefs and stick by them. I really do. We're going to miss you. Walton shaved it right then and there. Now Bill Walton calls him once a week just to tell the coach he loves him. Unassuming greatness. Extraordinary gifts, incredible competence. But he never knew how great he was. How refreshing. I failed to mention during those years he was coach, there was never a salary squabble. There was no DWI scandal, no sad story of coach abusing a player, not one skeleton rattling in the closet about a sexual affair with some other woman, ever. Just unassuming greatness. The best example of all, of course, is Jesus, our Savior. But the 12 disciples seemed like they spent those three and a half years overlooking that. They were so busy positioning themselves for a place of significance. Mark records a couple of those moments in the life of Jesus with his disciples. The first is in Mark chapter 9 at verse 33 where they have finished a long walk and have come to the town of Capernaum. 
near the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. They go in a house, we read in verse 33, and he begins to question them. What were you discussing on the way, he asks. <laughs> I wonder if their faces didn't turn a little red. I wonder who would be willing to speak first and admit what the talk was about as they walked single file behind him. Finally, they screwed up enough courage to admit after the silence that they had been discussing with one another which of them was the greatest. Stupid discussion. But they were good at those kind of discussions. <laughs> who would be number one? Or if you've got to be, then who would be number two? And right down the line. You don't see it in the text, but I can't believe that there wasn't a deep sigh as he sits down, verse 35, calls them to himself and says, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. That's a funny line to give to people who are unashamedly ambitious, but it's true. And if it wasn't enough for them to hear the words, he, he called a child from the house over to him. Come here, come here, sweetheart. Come here, son. Maybe put a boy on one knee and a girl on the other. Said, whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. Whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. Reminds me of the line that appears at the end of Matthew, inasmuch as you have done it unto these, even the least of them, you've done it unto me. I love that. They didn't get it. So turn the page and you'll read a similar account in chapter 10, verse 35 where two of them decide they'll no longer talk to the other ten about it. They'll just go directly to their leader. And there's, it's, it's James and John. James and John. Two of the top three of his most intimate. The sons of Zebedee came up to him, chapter 10, verse 35, and they said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. <laughs> Sounds like something you'd ask one of these profs, doesn't it? <laughs> Promise you'll do for me whatever I ask you to do. He said, what do you want me to do for you? They have the audacity. After that previous lecture and object lesson to say, Grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. Not, not the middle seat that's yours, but one on the right, one on the left. I mean, it's only right, Lord. Look what we've given up. Forgetting what he had given up to come. And he, in his unassuming greatness, said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Sometimes there are answers that great men give that just sort of level us. And we are chagrined. We're just taken aback by them. It's happened to me many times in my life. I'll never forget when I was sitting on the front row in a Greek class and Dr. Lewis Johnson was teaching us Romans and, no, it was Corinthians. We were in Corinthians and I, I remember he asked a question out of chapter 11 that, you know, probably the apostles couldn't have answered, but I had the answer. And so I <laughs> threw my hand in the air almost before he got the question out of his mouth. And I began to go into this answer. And the if you ever, you've done this. The longer my answer was, the worse it got. And 
finally it sort of drifted into a fog of <laughs> quietness. And Dr. Johnson said, Mr. Swindoll, you continue with that answer out on that long limb. I'm going to saw you off with a hard set of facts. <laughs> <laughs> so I crawled quickly back to the trunk and slid down and <laughs> stayed quiet for a while. You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? You don't understand, men. Greatness comes through suffering, through dying to yourself, through surrender, through submission. It comes through a willingness to go wherever and do whatever, whenever, for whatever reason the Father plans. That's greatness. You don't have a clue. Are you able to do this? They said, we're able. 39 tells of their almost impudent response. He says, the cup that I drink, you shall drink, and you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. Symbolic terms referring to their deaths. And what deaths they had. One was exiled as an, old, as an old man. One was martyred in 44 by Herod. You don't have any idea what the future holds. But to sit on my right or on my left is not mine to give. It is for those to whom it has been prepared. Don't ever forget that. Greatness doesn't come necessarily to the brightest and the best, to those with the highest IQ or those most gifted linguistically or most capable on their feet. It's a character quality. And the Father preserves and reserves that particular position for those He chooses. Now, about now, you might think, well, at least the other ten stood back and thought, well, we could learn a lot from this. <laughs> Wrong. Verse 41, hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant. Strong word, indignant. They were irritated. I mean, what about us? They were aggravated with James and John. Realizing that there was a virtual mutiny starting, Jesus says to them, come here, men. Come over here. Pulls them aside, calls them to himself, and turns the dialogue into a monologue. This is one of those brief discourses that I hope you never forget. He said to them, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Their great men exercise authority over them. Look again at the verse. You know this. In the rank and file of the military and the corporate world and the political world, there is a definite, clearly defined chain of command there are generals and there are colonels and there are majors and there are captains and there are lieutenants and there are sergeants and there are corporals. It's like that in the military world. There are CEOs and COOs and CFOs. In the political world, there are presidents and vice presidents and cabinet members and it works that way. It's all part of the organizational plan. However, the Greek, with great emphasis, begins the next verse. Not so is it among you. Not so. It doesn't work like that in the family of God. There is no status or rank. There is no power play for gaining a position. It's like the psalmist writes, don't lift up your horn on high. 
don't blow your own horn. Do not speak with insolent pride, for not from the east, nor from the west, nor from the desert comes exaltation. God is the judge. He puts down one and he exalts another and it is his sovereign right. Whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served. And look at the verbs. He came to serve and he came to give his life a ransom for many. People like us, would you look around? There's not a one of us even a partially deserving. He came to serve and to give, to serve and to give. I just finished reading again uh, Leighton Ford's outstanding book, Transforming Leadership. In it, he writes this. Several years ago, I had lunch with Richard Dortch, who had just been chosen to become the executive vice president of the PTL Club, a multi-million dollar religious televangelism network. Dortch had headed his denomination's work in Illinois, had an outstanding track record. I was frankly very impressed with what he had to say and with his seeming sincerity and competence. He planned to recruit a strong finance director and several MBAs to establish some fiscal sanity, as he put it. It's going to be like turning the Queen Mary around with a teaspoon, he said. Won't be easy, but I plan to do it. I wished him well and then watched from a distance. Eventually, Jim Baker, the head of PTL, resigned in disgrace over a sexual liaison and its cover-up. Both he and Dortch were convicted for the misuse of funds. How, I wonder? How could a man with such seemingly good intentions go so wrong? So I read with interest a later interview in which he described how the managers of PTL came to define success. Listen to this. Quote, it is all tied to how many stations we have on our network or how big our building is. It is so easy to lose control, to compromise without recognizing it. At PTL, there was not time taken for prayer or family because the show had to go on. We were so caught up in God's work that we forgot about God. He also talked about the impact of television on preachers. A television camera, he said, can change a preacher quicker than anything else. Those who sit on the sidelines can notice the changes in people once they get in front of a camera. It turns a good man into a potentate. It is so easy to get swept away by popularity. Everybody loves you. Cars are waiting for you, and you go to the head of the line. That is the devastation of the camera. It has made us less than what God wanted us to become. In PTL's case, the TV camera, the show, even the ministry itself had become ends in themselves. They were powers which could have been creative but which in the end actually became destructive. Ford concludes, for those of us not in the public eye, it's easy to point the finger at the Jim Joneses and the Jim Bakers, but power can be just as seductive to a teacher in a classroom. A physician in an examining room, the boss in a union meeting, or the leader of an average church. We live in a dog-eat-dog -dog world and it quickly and easily invades the ranks of the religious. 
So today I, I come with great hope for you who are looking at this school with your future in mind. But I come today with a word of warning to all of us. Be careful. Walk humbly with your God, regardless, regardless of how much you learn and how greatly you'll be used. Walk humbly with your God, regardless of how well you become known or however greatly the Lord blesses. Walk humbly with him. The world has a different counsel. When you're attacked, retaliate. Don't do that. When you're criticized, defend. Don't do that. When you're skilled and gifted, claw and climb your way to the top. Don't do that. Don't do that. You don't need an agent. God will find you. David wasn't busy about making himself known when that giant roamed the slopes of the Valley of Elah. God found him. And when he slew the giant, it's wonderful, he didn't quickly go downtown looking for crowns. He, he went right back with his father's sheep. Unassuming greatness. When others seem equally capable and competent, the world says, compete. Don't do that. That's what the world does. Next time you're tempted to turn your ambition loose, I give you three words. First, remember. Remember. Remember the lifestyle of the people of the kingdom. Remember Jesus' words, it is not so among us. Second, release. Release the controls to God. Release the importance of your reputation. Uh, it was Wooden who said this, be more concerned with your character than with your reputation. Your character is what you really are, while your reputation is merely what others think you are. Most folks will think you're better than you are. Do your best to correct them. The closer they get to you, the more they'll realize you're not that good. A few people are, the Woodens, the Tom Landrys, many of these who teach you but they would never be the ones to say so. So release that. Third, return. Return to the priorities of Jesus to serve and to give. Back when I had the privilege of uh, sitting in the president's office of this great school, one of the high marks was uh, a time I would take to do exit interviews with graduates. It was always refreshing to, to be with them and to see the, the product of our teaching and our mentoring and time with them. One particular year was especially meaningful to me because our youngest son came on campus to visit with us. We hadn't seen him for months. He lived in Nashville. Some distance had come between him and me through mistakes I had made and we were in the process of rebuilding our lives so it was especially good to have him with me and with us and uh, he didn't know I was doing exit interviews and he just kind of followed me around from one thing to another so when it came time for the interview it was great for me to sit back and he was right in the middle it was terrific here were all these hotshot graduates from Dallas Seminary eight or ten of them and here he was in the middle firing questions. 
It was great. I watched it, and about an hour or so after the exit interview ended, I was taking him to the airport to get him on his flight back to Nashville. He was really quiet. I said, well, thanks for coming. He said, I loved it, Dad. Really, the best part wasn't being with you, but was being with those graduates. And I said, they're terrific. He said, uh, let me tell you something, Dad. I've never been around a more humble group of men and women in my life. Isn't that great? I was so proud of you. It was such a joy to hear him say that. Never been around a more humble group of men and women in my life. In many ways, it changed his life. At that time, his hair was down to his waist. I remember when I did the wedding for him and his wife, I, I said, would one of you kiss the bride? I, 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 I couldn't tell my look. Again. <laughs> Scout's honor. He went home. He said to Jenny, uh, let's cut this hair off. I mean, not that anybody around here said, your hair's too long. The wonderful thought is that nobody said that, that the students put their arms around him and loved him and in a matter of really months, we began to see a whole difference. We haven't talked about that visit much, but I look back on it as a turning point. By the way, if uh, you had been one of those in that group, would he have had that same response? I hope so. Many wonderful and great men and women have sat where you're sitting. They've come through this school and they've now graduated to serve and to give. And it was here that we learned the basic rudiments of ministry. The best part wasn't in the textbooks, it was in the mentoring. It was in seeing in the lives of those who taught us these kind of things. I said to Cynthia as I put my tie on and got ready for this morning, I said, well, I'm back on a campus. She smiled and said, let's see, when did all this start? I said, back in 1959. We didn't even have any kids. Here we are with 10 grandkids. And she said, and that school is still great. <laughs> and it is. Unassumingly great. Our Father, in our lives, be glorified. When we survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, our richest gain we count but loss and poor contempt and all our pride. Be glorified in our in our family, be glorified in our church. May you be exalted as we are abased. That's what pleases you. And what pleases you is what we want. Help us in these years of learning and growing to get that lesson down clearly. that Christ is to be glorified and we are to give and to serve. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody said.